prophecy, um, about Christ, about things that have happened in the Bible. This week I want to continue that, but to look at it in the light of prophecy that is happening now, that has happened in the 20th century, that is shaping our world and our destiny into the future. And so first I want to look at the vision. If you want to know what's really going on in the world today, you have to really understand what's going on in the Word of God, what the Bible is saying about these days that we live in. Because if you don't understand it, everything looks random. Every, you know, what's going on in the Middle East? What's going on in Africa? What's going on in the United States? What are all these things have to do with the Bible and God's Word? And I think a good place to start um, is Mark 13. And that is where Jesus was talking about, and it's also in... Uh, Matthew 24, but this is the, the ending, uh, or where Jesus predicts the ending of the nation of Israel as it existed uh, when Jesus lived, and that they were separated and sent into exile around the world uh, a few years after uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. And so let me read verse 1 in Mark 13. It says, As they were leaving the temple, one of Jesus' disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. So they're there at the temple. They're looking at these massive stones. And um, one of the his historians, Josephus, had said about those stones that uh, they, were, uh, they were big, they were white, and some of them were 37 feet long. They were 12 feet high, that's higher than one story, and they were 18 feet wide. That's how big these stones were. No wonder they were marveling at them. And uh, Jesus said, not one of these stones would be left on another. And so that happened literally in 70 AD. That's when Titus came and sacked Jerusalem and destroyed it. And uh, the stones were pried apart to collect the gold leaf that had melted on the roof from the temple that was set in stone. So when Herod built, rebuilt that temple, up in there, he put gold leaf up there, so I guess it probably, you know, shined with the sun and everything. It looked really beautiful. Well, when they burned it, the gold melted in between the stones. And so when the Romans came in, they started prying the stones apart. Why? Because they wanted the gold. They wanted the money. They didn't do it to fulfill biblical prophecy. But Jesus said, not only will the temple be destroyed, but that every stone would be pulled apart and thrown down. And in excavations in 1968 uncovered large numbers of these stones toppled from the walls by their invaders. And so Jesus said that the, there was a day coming when this temple would be destroyed, when the nation would be dispersed. That happened in 70 AD, just as Jesus had said. And what I want to do is I want to draw for you a, a picture, a tapestry. Now you see a tapestry that's made. On the one side there is this picture and the picture that I want you to see is the picture of the world today and Israel as it exists. And on the back, if you look on the back of a tapestry, you see all the threads that go through. And those threads are the Bible prophecy that has tied everything together, that is bringing everything that we see coming to pass today. More Bible prophecy has been fulfilled in the last hundred years than in any other time since the birth of Christ. Now think about that. All the prophecies that were fulfilled around the time of the birth of Christ. And from that time, 2,000 years forward, we are seeing more fulfillment of Bible prophecy than in any other time in the last 2,000 years. That will let you know, first and foremost, that we are living in the last days. That everything that the Bible has said is going to come to pass. And so I want to look at, uh, in the light of the last 10 days, in your uh, highlight sheet, there's a handout 
that has uh, 10 Bible prophecies, 10 from last week. I'm going to look at the 10 from this week, and I want to focus on a few of them and to give you an idea of what's taking place. So uh, number one, we see that God would restore the an ancient language. That was of Hebrew. Now many of you may not know this, but Hebrew was not a spoken language for the past 2,000 years. And even in the time of Jesus, most of the people spoke Greek or Aramaic. They didn't speak Hebrew. Only the teachers of the law, the priests, uh, knew the language of Hebrew. It was a written language, but it had been dead for over 2,000 years. And this is what it says in Zephaniah 3.9, in fulfillment of that prophecy. For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve Him with one consent. God knew that 2,000 years later, when they started coming from the east, the north, the south, the west, from different countries all over the world, from Africa, from Europe, from the states, uh, from uh, different parts of the world, that they would have different languages coming in, but God was going to unify them with one language, and that would be the Hebrew language. Now, the man that was credited single-handedly for reviving the Hebrew language was a man by the name of Eleazar ben Yuda. And he was born January 7th, 1858. Now, he was a Russian Jew. Now, he had an interesting experience when he was a young boy. God spoke to him in a vision. And he said, repeated three times, the land and the language. The land and the language. The land and the language. Kind of similar to what Peter experienced with the uh, sheets coming down when he was up on that rooftop three times. God showed it to him. Well, he grew up and he got interested in a lot of the sciences. He wanted to be a doctor. He went over to Europe and um, he was there studying. And while he was there, he uh, contracted tuberculosis. He became very ill. And while he was there, God spoke to him again in a vision, and he said this, the land and the language, the land and the language, the land and the language. And he knew that he was supposed to go to Israel, which is desolate at the time, and that he was supposed to teach Hebrew. He had to, revive, he had to write the dictionaries. He had to do all this stuff to revive the Hebrew language. He was going to teach his family. He was going to teach the neighbors. Then he was going to start schools and start to begin to teach and revive this language. One of the stories is that when his child was born, he decided that this child would never hear another language while he was growing up except Hebrew. That was the only thing that was spoken in the house. When friends came over that spoke a different language, he would send them to bed. He did not want him, his child to ever hear another spoken language while he was growing up except Hebrew. He'd be the first authentic child that spoke in Hebrew. And so as he continued to do this work in the 1920s, they made it the official language there. And by 1948, when Israel became a nation, it was the official language of Israel. It was spoken in the homes, the newspapers that you read, the TV telecasts, everything was the official language of Hebrew. And so when you came from another nation, you had to learn Hebrew, just like English is the official language here. Hebrew is the official language in Israel. And God had told in advance. You know, if this just kind of happened the way it happened, but there was no prophecy, you would think, well, that was kind of interesting. But God tells in advance what is going to take place. He said in Malachi, Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plans to his servants, the prophets. So God said, I'm going to tell you in advance, before all of this stuff happens, that it's going to happen. And when it happens then you will know that I'm the one who did it. So you can put your trust in me. I want to tell you one of the bottom lines of what I want you to get today is that God is sovereign. A God who can tell us things that was written down 2,500 years ago and that they're coming to pass today, you know that that God is in control that that God is sovereign. And furthermore, you can trust 
the Word of God. Because there's no other book like this book. It is the inerrant, inspired Word of God. Number two, Israel became a nation in a day. This is what it says in Isaiah 66, 8. Who has ever heard of such a thing? Who has ever seen such a thing? Can a country be born in a day? Or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Now the threads that go through this prophecy, the beginning, and this is something interesting as well. All the major events of the 20th century, World War I, World War II, the Cold War, all had significant implications, not just significant, but direct implications in fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Because what God does, He works through the circumstances, He works through all the things, through the nations and uh, the leaders. God will use His people, God will use the enemy to fulfill his prophecy because God, again, is sovereign. He is in control. So when World War I uh, and World War II played a significant role in part of the tapestry of the restoration of Israel. Now you need a little history lesson, so this will be extra and free. Uh, the Middle East, at the turn of the century, the beginning of the 20th century, it was controlled by the Ottoman Empire. That's Turkey, okay? And they controlled it for over 600 years. It was an Islamic uh, nation. They controlled all of the Middle East. At the height of their power, they had control over in Africa, parts of Europe, Spain, France, uh, part of Great Britain. They had a wide uh, area of control. And so over the years, they had uh, complete control of the Middle East uh, at the beginning of World War I. Uh, and so it was controlled by the Ottoman Empire. And uh, during a revival time in England, back in the 1880s, there was a great love for the Jewish people. You know, when God works on us, He causes us to love our enemies, but He also will put a great love for the people of Israel and the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, uh, on our hearts. And so this young boy had a great love uh, for the Lord. It says, exemplifying the love was this prayer. One English boy was taught by his mother to include in his devotions. So his mother taught him this prayer that he prayed every day as a child going into his adulthood. O oh Lord, we would not forget thine ancient people Israel. Hasten the day when Israel shall be again thy people and shall be restored to thy favor and to their land. So he prayed this, he prayed this. In World War I, British General Edmund Allery entered the Holy Land with a troop of 100,000 British soldiers. The British would take the city of Jerusalem without a fight. Allenby was the boy who prayed that prayer. The one that would be the one who would take the city of Jerusalem, as a young boy was praying this prayer. Was it a coincidence that God chose him to go into the army, to rise to the rank of general, and be the one who would liberate Jerusalem uh, after six or seven hundred years being in captivity? But that's exactly what God did. What's more amazing was that according to Daniel's ancient prophecy, and we heard about this a little bit in the film, that it was said that Jerusalem would be restored in 1,335 years. The prophet Haggai said the day of blessing would be on the 24th day of the ninth month of the Hebrew calendar. That day was December 9th, 1917, the very day that the mayor of Jerusalem handed the keys over to Allenby. Isn't that unbelievable? On the very day, the prophecy came to pass. And that set up what happened in World War II, that after the Holocaust, the United Nations 
You know, that godless body, the United Nations, made a declaration that the Jewish people must have a homeland so that this atrocity should never happen again. And on that very day, May 15, 1948, Israel, in a moment, became a sovereign nation. It was a direct result of the Holocaust that took place at the end of World War II that opened the door for uh, Israel to become a nation again. And you see throughout history, whether it's Hitler, whether it was Haman in the Old Testament in the book of Esther, the people who came against the nation of Israel, they were ultimately destroyed and Israel was ultimately blessed. Remember the uh, prayer that, uh, or the word that God gave Abraham last week? I will curse those who curse you and I will bless those who bless you. And so there it was. Who has ever heard of such a thing? Who has ever seen such a thing? Can a nation, can a country be born in a day or a nation be brought forth in a moment? And literally that's what happened. At midnight on May 14th going into the 15th, Israel became a sovereign, self-sufficient nation for the first time in over 2,500 years in fulfillment of biblical prophecy. The God that we serve, you know, uh, I mentioned a couple weeks ago when Peter and the disciples were on the boat and Jesus calmed the raging storm. And they're watching him and the wind and the waves died down. And they looked at each other and said, who is this guy? Who is this God that we serve? They were so amazed and they began to worship. I want to tell you, when you see God doing these things, we should have that same awe. We should have that same sense of who is this God really that we serve. He is almighty. He is all-powerful. He is going to fulfill his plans, and he has let us know in advance. Let me just quickly go through some of the rest of these. I want to focus on the last two. But the third one, that God would make a covenant with Israel to never be destroyed, Jeremiah 31, 36, and verse 40. What that means is, when Israel became a nation in 1948, from that point to the end of time, Israel will never be uprooted again. It will never be destroyed. It will never be wiped out. God will protect that nation from here to the end of time, to the time that God creates the new heaven and the new earth. He said that, he would rebuild the ancient cities, Ezekiel 36, 33 through 36. You saw in the film, God did exactly that. He has rebuilt all the ancient cities of Jerusalem and Jericho and all the other places, Bethlehem, that God has restored these. These are things that have happened in our lifetime that we can see and know that it happened. Number five, the desert would bloom as a wild rose. Now that can sound poetic, but you know what's happened? In the Negev, uh, they have actually, they're growing flowers. They're growing roses there, and they're exporting them all across Europe. That's not just poetic. That is a literal prophecy that has been fulfilled. He would call the Jews back from the east and the west, Isaiah 43, verse 5. Uh, number seven, he would call the Jews back from the land of the north. That's Jeremiah 31, 8 and Isaiah 43, 6. And let me just say there, there were no Jews in the north region when Jeremiah made this prophecy. He made this prophecy before the Jews were even there. And then when they were there, he said that God would bring them back and he did just that in the 1990s. What happened in the 1990s? The Berlin Wall fell, the end of the Cold War. Uh, at that time, that uh, the president, Mikhail Gorbachev, you know, the perestroika, he said, listen, we're going to change things, we're going to loosen up things, people are going to be able to uh, have freedom. The Jews, for the first time, would be able to leave 
Russia. And they left over a million Russian Jews, decided since the doors were open, they were going to pick up, they were going to move to Israel. And God fulfilled that prophecy at the end of the Cold War. All the events that are happening, God is sovereignly in control, fulfilling those prophecies. God would call the Jews back from the south. That was Ethiopia. And Zephaniah 3.10, Isaiah 43.6. And number nine, these are prophecies that have not taken place yet, but will take place, I believe, in the near future. And the ninth one is that he predicts the war of Gog and Magog. And you wonder, well, what war is that? You can call it the Little Armageddon. It is going to be a massive war of nations that are going to try again for the third or fourth time to wipe Israel off the map. And specifically, Russia and Iran. Now, the tapestry of this prophecy begins in 1978. If you remember what happened in 1978, uh, I'll refresh your memory. Uh, it was the time of the fall of the Shah of Iran. The, Iran used to be a U.S. ally until the Shah fell, and then the Islamic Revolution came up. And one of the college students, you remember all the uh, people that were held in captivity, the hostages for over 444 days? Okay, that was the uh, Islamic Revolution that started. And one of the uh, college students was Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. He was one of the former presidents of Iran. And so they became an ally that turned into one of our staunch enemies in 1978. And for the first time in multiple thousands of years, there was a military and a nuclear agreement between Russia and Iran. Why is that significant? Because in their entire history, they have always been arch enemies. But according to Ezekiel 39, they're going to make an alliance. They're going to make a military alliance. And so they have. And all the other nations that are talked about in Ezekiel 38.5, Ethiopia, Turkey, Kuwait, Yemen, and many other military uh, nations, uh, many of those other nations would make an alliance with Russia and Iran, and ultimately one day attack Israel. Okay? Have we seen any of that taking place? I mean, we are right there at the door. Now, when I first started getting into this, now I want to tell you, when I, I had no idea about Bible prophecy happening today as we are living and speaking today, how it's all being fulfilled. Back in uh, the early 2005, 2006, um, I started researching and looking at all this stuff. I was absolutely blown away. I mean, I felt like I was in the twilight zone, seeing all these things coming to pass in our lifetime. I want to tell you that if you have a hard time seeing or perceiving or understanding all this that's going on, if you lived 2,000 years ago, you probably wouldn't have believed that Jesus was the Son of God. Because he was the carpenter's son. He didn't look like a king. And, you know, is he really... The, and besides, the people in the know, you know, all the Pharisees and all the teachers and the leaders, they said, no, he's not the Messiah. So I want to tell you, you need to be able to see and understand what is taking place. God is fulfilling these prophecies. So anyhow, back in 2006, uh, the president at that time in Russia was Vladimir Putin. And he was the one making these alliances. And I told our congregation back then, I said, if he doesn't go the way of uh, Gorbachev, go the way of Boris Yeltsin, you know, when their terms were over, they left. I said, if he hangs around and hangs on to power, he could very well be the world leader that's called Gog, that's the name of the leader, like a president, like a uh, emperor or um, prime minister. Uh, he could very well be that person. 
that is going to be the leader of this war. And I want to tell you that today, in 2015, I am absolutely certain that he is that leader because he did not go away and he has fulfilled all these things that the Bible said that he would do with these alliances and he is the former head of the KGB. I mean, we could literally, uh, I believe, sooner rather than later see this come to pass. That's why it's so significant as you watch on the news every night. If Iran gets nuclear weapons, what could possibly happen to the Middle East and turn, I want to say, not only the Middle East, but the whole world upside down? I believe that maybe before uh, the end of the Obama administration, we could see that war. That's how close we could be. But let me say again, God is sovereign. God is is in control. Now, if you happen to be on the fence about your relationship with the Lord, I would just say to you, just saying, you might want to reconsider where you're standing and walking with the Lord at this time because it's happening. We are getting to that time where it's going to be crunch time. You can see the fires going on in the country. You can see the fires going on in your home. You can see it happening in your community. There's no place where we're not seeing all kinds of strife and upheaval. And that's all part of Bible prophecy as well. Let's look at the last one predicts the rebuilding of Solomon's temple. That's Ezekiel 40. That will come as a direct result of the war of Gog and Magog, which will clear the temple mount for the rebuilding of Solomon's temple. Now, where does this prophecy have its roots, have its tapestry beginning? 1967. That was the Six-Day War, an incredible war that God gave Israel victory, I mean, over the Palestinians. They had like six or seven nations coming against Israel. God supernaturally, in six days, wiped out the enemies, and um, they quadrupled their landmass. Russia called the United States and said, call them off or we're getting involved. And so they stopped the war at the end of six days. It started on Sunday, and they were done on uh, the evening of Friday, just in time for the Sabbath rest. Is that a sovereign work of God? Well, in the Six-Day War, for the first time, Israel recaptured Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not a part of Israel in 1948 when it was given as a nation. And so they get Jerusalem. One of the soldiers who was there as they recaptured Jerusalem, and they are there at the Temple Mount, he had an epiphany. He had a word he believed was from God. And his purpose was to start the preparations for the rebuilding of Solomon's temple. And so in uh, 2017, it will be 50 years since this Temple Mount project has started. All the temple furnishings, uh, have been complete. They've raised up all the priests necessary for the sacrifices, all the internal elements that they need for rebuilding the temple is already in place. They reconstituted the Sanhedrin. You read about that in the New Testament. All these things are happening right on God's timeline. These prophecies will affect every living man, woman, and child on the planet. Now, I don't know about you, but if this is hitting you for the first time and you kind of feel like, man, I am in the twilight zone here, you just turn to your neighbor and say, Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. <laughs> can you imagine? Can you imagine? And I want to tell you, in order to make sense of all this, you can't just look at the political and the economic you got to look through the thin, third lens of Scripture, Bible prophecy, because that sheds the light on all the things that are happening and all the things that are going on in the nations. And God 
Our God is sovereignly in control. Okay, so let's look at the second point, and I'm going to fly through the rest of this pretty quickly. Now, the uh, last days will be marked by an increase in knowledge and wickedness. I don't have to say too much about that, do I? I mean, it's pretty self-evident. But Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 12, He said that because of the increase in wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Our job, first and foremost, is to stand firm in our faith. Did you ever play um, Steal the Bacon or what was the other game that we used to play? Kill the Man with a Ball. That's what we used to play. You know, you got the football, you got... 10 or 11 guys trying to rip it out of your hands and take the ball from you. That's what the enemy's trying to do to your faith. He wants to snatch that seed of salvation out of your heart. He's going to try and rip out your faith so that you do not believe. He who stands firm to the end will be saved. Jesus goes on to say in verse 21, For then there will be great stress unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, praise God, those days will be shortened. So if we're allowed to go down this path unhindered, not stopped by God, we would literally destroy ourselves according to Jesus. But God's going to cut those days short before we would annihilate ourselves. The other one, there would be a marked increase in knowledge, Daniel 12.4. But you, Daniel, close up the seal of these words of the scroll until the time of the end. So what will happen at the times of the end? It says, many shall move to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. I mean, we're living in unprecedented times. Don't really need to preach on that too much. Just give you one or two illustrations and I'll move on. My grandmother was born at the turn of the century. You know, early 1902, 3, 4. She was born before Henry Ford invented the Model T, before the Wright brothers took off from Kitty Hawk. She was literally born in the horse and buggy age. Can you imagine from that time, 45 years later, we would enter the nuclear atomic age with the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? How could you do that in such a short amount of time? Before her 69th birthday, we put a man on the moon. And when she was born, we couldn't get a man in the air. And literally, we put a man on the moon. Unbelievable. And, you know, all the technology that we live in today. I mean, it's like we were in the Flintstones. Now we're living in the Jetsons, for those of y'all who remember. But isn't it incredible to think about where we have come from in such a short time? And the wickedness and this knowledge plays a significant role in what's coming next. With the cashless society the uh, mark of the beast, all these things that are going to be taking place. And so God has been telling us and showing us. And let's look at the uh, second point. And this point, the victory. Now we need to get this point because this is just as important as anything that I've said prior. And in some ways it's more important because we must have the victory in these days to be able to survive. God's Spirit and God's words will bring the victory to us in John 14, 12. Now the first thing, if God told us, if God told us in advance what was going to happen, and it happened just the way He said, that means that God is sovereign, He's in control, so you don't have to get uptight, you don't have to fret about the things that are coming, because these things can be a little bit Scary. They can be a little bit unnerving when you begin to see all these things that are taking place. And since this world is passing away, we need to have a singular focus. 
on Christ. Don't use your pent-up energy on worry. If you're worrying and fretting, that's what the rest of the world is doing about all these things that are taking place. You know, that's like a nuclear explosion in your life. Direct your energy to the Lord, and that would be like nuclear energy that is going to focus and direct your path. Focus your relationship on the Lord, being in the presence of the Lord. He's going to give you the strength. He's going to give you the power. He's going to give you the blessing to be able to make it through these days. Now, Jesus said this in John 14, 12, and I want to tie it in. He says, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing he will do even greater things than these because I go to the Father and I will do whatever he asks in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father and you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it now let me ask you the question that I've asked that most people have asked that you may have asked how could we possibly be doing greater things than what Jesus did. But that's what he said, didn't he? Was he serious about what he said? Well, obviously, he's the Lord, so he was serious. Now, let me give you the answer that I believe. It is the nature of God. He always saves the best wine for last. Has anybody ever gone to a 4th of July fireworks show? If you've ever gone, uh, a few of you have gone. Okay, for the rest of you who have never gone, um, I want to explain. What is the best part of the fireworks show? It's the finale. There you go. It would be kind of a dud if there was no grand finale. God has got a grand finale in store for this world and for His people. And he said that he is going to pour out his spirit. There was going to be an early and a latter rain. That early rain happened in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came and was poured out. There was going to be a latter rain. And that would happen in the last days. Where are we living now? In the last days. So we can expect a latter rain and that God is going to pour out his spirit. Why? Because this is going to be one of the greatest harvest seasons that the world has ever seen. God is going to pull out all the stops because you don't want to be left behind for the next show, for the next act, for the seven years of trials and tribulations. God is going to do everything possible that he might win and save as many as possible. And so Jesus said, that we would do even greater things in these last days. And here's the significance, verse 13. You can't miss this. It says, And I will do whatever you ask in my name. Why? So the Son may bring glory to the Father. Everything that Jesus did was to bring glory to the Father. Not to himself, not to anyone else. That's why when the Satan told him to jump from the temple, do a great miracle, he wouldn't do it because that wouldn't bring glory to the Father. If we are singularly focused on seeking God, seeking the eternal, not the temporal that is passing away, and we are focused on bringing glory to God, as His children, He is going to begin to pour out His Spirit into our hearts. God is going to begin to do things in our lives that are not only going to change us, build our faith, but it is going to have an impact on our neighbors, our friends, and our society. You have no idea what God's real plans are for each and every one of you. What God's plans are for this church. Why He's planted us today for such a time as this here in Miramar, in southwest Broward, in Pembroke Pines area. God can do incredible things in these last days. Now, once God accomplishes 
all that he has had in mind as we get to the end. I want to tell you just one of my favorite verses about spiritual warfare, about how God is going to defeat the enemy. It's in 2 Thessalonians 2.8. You can just jot that down. You don't have to turn there. But it says, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth. That's all it's going to take for God to wipe out the enemy because Satan is just a servant of God. He looks mean and tough and uh, all-powerful right now and that's primarily because of the void and the vacuum because we're not walking in the power that God has ordained for us as a church but as God poured that back in and everything is accomplished God is going to overcome him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. God just has to show up and the war is won. God will have the victory. Do you remember every time that a demon-possessed person came to Jesus, they immediately hit the ground right in front of Jesus and they usually started begging, don't throw us into the abyss before our given time. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, the soldiers came to arrest him. And he asked, who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth replied. He said, I am he. And uh, when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. These soldiers, in the presence of Jesus, they could not stand. And if Christ is living in us, then the enemy cannot prevail over us. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. We just need to awaken to what God is doing inside of us to begin to believe and receive by faith that God has given us the victory. I mean, I would expect for the last days, he would have probably called someone else besides me. You know, he would have probably called Moses or Daniel or some of the great, you know, David, great warriors. But you know what? He called us. Can you imagine? Because God can take the foolish things of the world and confound the wise. It's not because we're some great people, have some great intellect, some great gifts. God can use the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Every one of us, if we're used to the full potential of what God has called us to, will do incredible things, will impact the kingdom of God. We are here for such a time as this, as the world continues to fall apart, God is setting up the final and greatest harvest in human history. Let's look at the last point, and we're going to finish here. And uh, Abraham, you can come get ready to uh, <clears throat> play for us. The harvest is plentiful. This is uh, Luke 10.1. The world is ripe for its greatest harvest. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Now, isn't that kind of interesting? Why is it said that the workers are few? God will not impose His will on us. We must choose to follow and be used by Him. Did you get that? God isn't going to force you or me or anybody else to serve Him, to be a part of His army, to do all these things that He has preordained for us to do. We must choose for ourselves. For those who see the vanity of this world, that nothing satisfies like God. You know, everything that we run after in this world, it's just passing away, it's just passing away. And I kind of had an epiphany when my boys were about eight or nine years old. I ran to Blockbuster. I got one of my favorite movies from one of my favorite stars of all time. I said, boys, I got a great movie. It's a John Wayne movie. And they looked at me and said, who's he? I said, oh, come on. I mean, he hadn't been dead 10 years. They didn't know who he was. Well, some of you don't know who he was. But you know what? At his height, man, he was the greatest star in Hollywood. You know, and he'd just forgotten. All the things that we're running after today. You know what? It's just passing away. But eternity and the kingdom of God will never pass away. And add, those to the, add that to the eternal value that God wants to build 
in the kingdom of God that will never pass away, then God will pour out his spirit on those people with the signs and wonders following, doing greater things than these for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. All right, let me leave you with one final promise from God. And this was out of Daniel 12.3. He said this, Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. Those of us who are walking with God, those of us who are filled with the Spirit of God, we are going to shine, the Bible says, like the brightness of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. God has a great harvest field out there. And as we bring people to Christ, well, you got to get your bumper dented in or not. You know, as you start bringing people to the Lord, inviting them to the Lord. You know what? As those people come to know the Lord, you and I will shine like the stars. The Bible says, forever and ever. And what about all the people who never trusted God, who never thought about God? It says in Isaiah 65, they will never be remembered again or even mentioned. Most people have in their very heart of hearts, they want to do something spectacular. They want to do something noteworthy. They want to be remembered for all times. I mean, even the situation with Brian Williams this past week, the news anchor for NBC, you know, fabricating all these stories because he's trying to build himself up. I mean, he's already at the top, but he wants to build himself up higher to be esteemed in the eyes of his peers and other people. Those people who aren't in the kingdom of God, who aren't serving the kingdom of God, they're not even going to be remembered. But those who are faithful to God, even the widow who put her might into the collection plate, God said she would be remembered for all eternity. Amen? Let's go ahead and stand together. If today you don't know this Lord of glory, the one who has fulfilled all these prophecies, the Lord of this book, the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Today you can begin a relationship with him. That God can prepare for us an eternal change in our life. You got situations in your life where you need prayer, where there's anxiety, there's worry, maybe you got stress at work, in your marriage, Whatever it is, and you need prayer, and God's putting it on your heart, you can have an opportunity before we close. We want to be able to pray for you because.